Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Before we get into this week's topic, we just wanted to shout out to the sponsors for this week's episode, our very own Dungeons of Drakenheim campaign, which is now live on Kickstarter. Our campaign has already blown past its goals in the first five minutes, and we are now looking at hitting all of our stretch goals. So make sure to jump on the project so that you can help unlock all of the great goodies waiting in the worlds of Drakenheim. In this project, we are bringing to life as a full 5th edition campaign for characters level 1 to 13, the campaign that we ran here on Twitch and YouTube uh, over the past couple of years. So if you watched our live streams and found the world of Drakenheim with its dark fantasy influences, cosmic horror, and urban exploration a fascinating and inspiring place to run a campaign, now you can. We've got this complete guide with all the adventure sites that we created and many new ones as we're hitting all of our stretch goals and we can really pack in all this amazing stuff that was never seen in the original campaign. This is also going to include new monsters, new spells and magic items, and rules for eldritch contamination to really make dire situations for your player characters. We have packed everything that we love about tabletop role-playing games into this campaign. It features action, exploration, dark fantasy, horror, madness, political intrigue, and it is ultimately a non-linear story that your players will ultimately be able to decide the fate of Drakenheim. So make sure to check the links below so that you can get in on the Kickstarter while it's running and help us uh, make this amazing world of Drakenheim come to life. And with that, let's get on to this week's topic. Today we are talking about how to play a blade singer wizard in D&D 5e. Now, after we did our most recent tier ranking videos for wizards that came up a few weeks ago, a lot of people actually asked us for a guide on how to play a blade singer, so this one's for you. We're going to look at the different features that you gain as a blade singer as you level up, as well as many of the feat choices you might want to consider, the spells that you might want to look at, and other build options, races, and backgrounds that you may consider when looking at a blade singer wizard. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. So, Monty, why would we want to play a blade singer wizard? Let's face it, the archetype of weaving swords and spells together um, is one of the classic images of fantasy itself, and it is a really fun playstyle to embrace. With the Bladesinger Wizard, you get to have the full experience of playing a spellcaster that gets all the way up to ninth level spells if you want to, in addition to gaining features that allow you to draw your sword and jump into combat, those beholders better would beware because that anti-magic field that they're going to send on your blade singer is probably going to work against them. <laughs> there are several archetypes in the game that present themselves as this sort of gish playstyle. Gish being the combination of sword and spell. But it's really starting to seem that Bladesinger might be one of the coolest options out there to have your full spell casting, but also excel in melee combat. The other impressive thing about the Bladesinger is folks that have crunched the numbers far better than us uh, have worked out how much damage a Bladesinger can actually deal by combining all of the various spells available to wizards with the ability to make attacks with a weapon. Oftentimes, when we think of a melee damage, damage dealer in D&D 5e, we often think of the paladin or the barbarian or even a fighter that is using a polearm, taking polearm master, great weapon master, or a rogue pulling some sort, sort of shenanigans. But a blade singer does great damage, and they do it all with say a short sword or a rapier. So as we set out to build our Bladesinger wizard, one of the first complications that we run into is where we're going to put our ability scores. Unlike something like the Hexblade Warlock, which allows you to use your charisma for your attack and damage rolls, the Bladesinger doesn't give you that option. So you do have to consider how heavy of a hitter you want to be and how good you want to be at spell casting. And with spell casting, we often look at constitution is another aspect of being able to maintain your concentration. So here we have a look at intelligence, we have a look at dexterity, and constitution. So those are probably going to be your three primary mm. stats that you want as a Bladesinger wizard, but how are we going to get all of those singing together to make this fit for our wizard? 
Yeah, the big question is, do you want to make your intelligence or your dexterity your highest ability score? As a Bladesinger, we're going to gain features like Bladesong and Extra Attack, which we'll talk about shortly, that are going to drive you towards making attacks with one-handed finesse weapons. So we're going to want to have a good dexterity score if we want to actually make attacks with weapons. So um, when we look at the ability score array that you and I use in our games, where we take a 17, a 15, a 13, a 12, a 10, and an 8, for me, I think I want to put my 17 in intelligence and my 15 into dexterity, and then my 13 into constitution. Where, where I'm going to put the rest of the scores doesn't really matter too much. That's more going to be a role-playing thing. I'm probably going to dump my strength, though, and have that just be the 8. I think that most blade singers are definitely going to be in the dexterity spectrum, and you're probably going to want a bit of wisdom and maybe charisma. Um, because if we look at the abilities, there are nods to charisma in mm -hmm. there. From there, we can look at our lineage to sort of round out these ability scores and even them up a little bit. So Kelly, what do you what stands out to you as lineage options that we could take? And especially if we're using the Tasha's rules where we can bounce our stats around, where do you think you would go with this? If you can bounce your stats around using Tasha's rules, then I think one of the primary choices for a blade singer is the half elf. And the half elf actually still speaks to the lore of what a blade singer is, because previously blade singer was exclusive to elves or mm -hmm. half elves. So if you are kind of set on that lore, using the new Tasha's options to mix and match, the half elf is one of the only subclass options that allows you to pick three different ability scores to boost. One gets a plus two and the other two get a plus one. So from that, you could round everything out. If you picked intelligence as your highest and dexterity as your second and then con as your third, I would actually put the plus two and maybe dexterity, mm. the plus one in intelligence and the other plus one in con. And then that way your dexterity and intelligence are more even. Uh, you could also put the plus two in intelligence and the plus one in dexterity if you wanted to go heavier on the spell casting. Yeah, I think also there's an, a, a straight up a case here to still go with the variant human and do plus one into, into intelligence, plus one into dexterity, and then I personally would take resilient constitution, which is going to boost my con from 13 to 14, but also give me proficiency in constitution saving throws. Because even though Bladesong is going to boost our ability to concentrate on our spells, by stacking that with a decent con score, proficiency in constitution saving throws, and that, it means that even when we're on the front lines taking those hits, we're probably not going to lose concentration on the critical spell that's keeping us there. We really don't want to lose concentration as a blade singer. And that is one thing to keep in mind, is that the abilities that grant you bonuses to your saving throws for concentration it still might not account for the fact that if you're on the front lines and you get hit three or four times, mm -hmm. that's a lot of dice rolls to make. So there's still that chance that you could go down. So the more layers of protection you have against losing your concentration, the better you're going to be at being a blade singer. Yeah, and I think speaking of having those layers of protection, when we look at the spells that we want to take uh, starting out, we definitely want to have shield in our arsenal. We definitely want to have absorb elements. And we definitely, I think, um, I think mage armor is worth considering. Even though blade, blade singers do get proficiency in light armor, at low levels of play, you might only be able to afford um, le basic leather armor, which is only 11 AC plus your dexterity. Where So mage armor is going give, to be giving you a plus two. Eventually, you might get magic studded leather armor, which is going to be better than whatever you have from mage armor. Um, they don't. You can't stack them, unfortunately. So it might be worthwhile taking mage armor. Of course, you're absolutely going to want to have fine familiar, and I do think at low levels of play, especially before you really get your blade song and your melee combat stuff rolling, this is a cool opportunity to bring spells like thunder wave and burning hands because you still might want to get in there. But I think the biggest thing we got to talk about right out the gate though is cantrips. What are we going to choose for a cantrip? So if you're going into the Blade Singer, I think one of the greatest cantrips that you can use is going to be Booming Blade. Now, Booming Blade is great because not only does it allow you to add extra damage to your attack, but also if you can get away from the target, which we'll talk about ways that you can do that with future spell choices, but if you can get away from the target, Booming Blade is a free way to dish out extra damage and then lock that creature down. A lot of people look at Booming Blade and they say, well, I don't get it. The creature just doesn't have to move and then they don't take that extra damage. So how is it a good cantrip? The point is, don't think about the extra damage. Think of that as a penalty for the lockdown that you are giving the creature that you hit. If you can hit a target, deal that extra damage and move away, if that target doesn't have ranged attacks, 
guess what? They're useless now on their next turn unless they break into a movement which will deal a ton of extra damage to them. Now, me personally, I think for cantrips with a Blade Singer, you still want to take a cantrip like Firebolt or Chill Touch or possibly even Frostbite because the ability to just throw a cantrip at range if you need to, I think is really handy to have in your back pocket. Beyond that, I would almost certainly take, you know, uh, Mage Hand or Prestidigitation or something else like that. I think after that, you just want to look at regular wizardy things. And especially if you are starting your character out at level one, you're probably going to want to bring something along like Sleep because it's really good at these levels. And this is one of those things to remember with a Blade Singer is that you are still a wizard and don't get ahead of yourself because you want to go and hit things with your sword. If there's an opportunity for you to end a combat encounter by casting Sleep, do it. Don't go in there and start stabbing people until you put them to sleep. Then it's even better. <laughs> now, with looking at our early level Blade Singer, we should also talk about the abilities that they gain. You're going to have to survive first level just being a wizard <laughs> until you actually get your class features that are going to let you fight. So what do we get when we get start off at level two? Well, you start things off with training in war and song, and this is what gives you your proficiency in light armor. It also gives you proficiency with one one-handed melee weapon of your choice, and it also gives you proficiency in the performance skill. Now, this might be a reason to play it now for a half-elf, because you only you don't get full martial weapon proficiency from a blade singer. So if you want to switch between, say, using two short swords to dual wield, or using a rapier, or using uh, scimitars, you don't actually have that flexibility. You won't get proficiency with all those weapons. So me personally, I'm going to go with the empty-handed sort of style. There's a reason to take short swords or scimitars, because you can dual wield through mid-levels, which is pretty good. But I think eventually I'm going to want to just have that hand free to make sure I can always cast a spell. So I'm going to go with the rapier myself. I mean, I think that's pretty iconic for a blade singer is you have a spell in one hand and a sword in the other, and that's the imagery that a lot of us are imagining with our blade singers. The other feature that you gain at second level, though, is probably the most important feature that you will gain as a blade singer, and that is blade song. This is a power that you can activate a number of times per day equal to your proficiency modifier uh, as a bonus action. And this gives you a buff that lasts for one minute that has a lot of amazing features to it. You gain a bonus to your AC equal to your intelligence modifier. You gain an extra 10 feet on your movement speed. And you have advantage on your dexterity acrobatics checks as well. You're also going to gain a bonus to your concentration checks equal to your intelligence modifier. Blade Song does end, however, if you become incapacitated, if you wear medium or heavy armor, or if you use two hands to make a weapon attack. So with all of that now in place, let's level up our Blade Singer. So now we're looking at around sixth level. At this point, you've gained another feat, there's more spells that you want to choose, and you're going to gain another feature. That feature being extra attack. This works just like the extra attack feature that many other classes get, that when you take the attack action on your turn, you can attack twice. But Blade Singers gain a little bit of an extra perk with this, in that they can replace one of those attacks with casting a cantrip. So now, what a Blade Singer can do is make an attack with Booming Blade, and then attack again. And that doesn't consume their bonus action, which makes it very unique from the other features granted to, say, um, Eldritch Knights or College of Valor Bards, in that you still have your bonus action free to do all the other cool stuff, like control animated objects or make a misty step or use the telekinetic feat so it means that you get to fight control your spells at the same time which is pretty awesome so also by the time we hit sixth level we're going to have either picked up another ability score increase or another feat and i think depending on the way you're building your blade singer there's a few ways to go i think in the case of the half elf which is what I would have built, I would go with Elven Accuracy as my feat. Oh yeah, there's so many ways to gain advantage as a Blade Singer. Just even sending in your familiar to help you, you're going to be able to really make the most of rolling three times with advantage. It's awesome. I think for my variant Human Blade Singer, I'm just going to boost my Dexterity by two. Um, I've got Resilient Constitution, so I'm, I'm nice and tough on that front. This is going to bring my Intelligence and my um, Dexterity both to 18 and I can be happy with that. Now this is where the spells are really going to be an important choice for you. And again, you're gonna hear this theme a lot from us today that although there are some great spell choices to really bolster the melee 
combat version of the Blade Singer, you should never discredit the main spells that a wizard wants to use. When we're looking at our sixth level Blade Singer, I think that if you haven't picked up Find Familiar yet, you need to have it. That's not only iconic for almost all wizards, but especially with the Blade Singer, it means that you can reliably gain advantage on your attacks. And if you take an Elven Accuracy, that's just going to kick it up to 11th gear. I think that since we are going to be jumping into melee combat, if we look at things like Mirror Image, Blink, or Misty Step, these are three spells that can be really, really helpful. I think the Misty Step actually stands out really well because it's a bonus action. So you could actually run in, land your Booming Blade, dish out your multiple attacks, and then Misty Step away, now locking that person in place. I also think that straight up, you got to take Fireball. You got to take Counterspell. You, you never leave home without them. Yeah. Because there's going to be a time with your Blade Singer where... There's a bunch of enemies together, and a Bladesinger doesn't want to get surrounded. So if you can take the foes out by having a well-timed uh, fireball, go for it. I also think in combining the damage dealing with the teleportation, Thunderstep is going to be a key piece to have in your arsenal. Because if you do get surrounded, it's the start of your turn, you need to just get out of dodge, Thunderstep out of there, and leave them with some damage as a present. But the real meat that we want to talk about is what is your Blade Singer going to be concentrating on and how are we going to use that to actually augment our melee combat ability? One of the go-to spells for Blade Singers is going to be something like Shadow Blade, which allows you to conjure a blade of shadowy energy that deals psychic damage and can be used as a finesse weapon. Now, one thing to be careful of is there was an errata that basically said that Booming Blade and Shadow Blade may not cooperate together, which is something that we all love doing with our Blade Singers. So talk to your DM about what their interpretation of that is. Because if you're going the Booming Blade route, Shadow Blade may not be a first choice. But if you didn't take Booming Blade, it's going to be amazing. The reason for this is that Booming Blade now has a material component, which is a melee weapon worth one gold piece. And Shadow Blade is conjuring a new weapon for you to use rather than augmenting any existing weapons. And the problems actually don't stop there because one of the things that I don't see come up in many conversations about Bladesingers at all is Bladesingers and magic items and Shadow Blade and magic items because a Bladesinger is going to want a magic sword. You're a magic swordsman. Obviously you want a magic sword. And a Bladesinger is a really good candidate for amazing magic weapons like even just a plus two rapier or a frost brand or a flame tongue yeah. if you can get your hands on one of these weapons it's a big boon especially because these weapons are often uh gravitate towards the finesse weapons in terms of their types and so um another amazing one actually for a blade singer would be a sun blade too yeah uh you can't use these weapons with shadow blade but you can use them with booming blade and so there's actually another spell that we can slot in here that is going to augment our melee damage. It's going to require concentration, but uh, it's not. It's still going to let us use a magic weapon, and that's Spirit Shroud. Spirit Shroud is a third level spell, and it adds an extra D8 to the damage of your melee attacks. Um, it also has a couple extra cool perks to it as well, and you can upcast it to increase those D8s. So it might be the spell that you're looking for. Another one that does have a really good um, argument for it, though straight up, is haste. You're gonna get be able to make an extra attack out of that. You're gonna get a bonus to your AC, and that ability to zip in, zip out, zip in, zip out, is really, really good, particularly around this level of play. I think haste is actually iconic, and the imagery of a uh, Blade Singer using haste is so fitting that I, th I think it needs to be on every Blade Singer's list. The thing is that you are also still a wizard, and so hasting yourself up to deal a lot of extra damage might be the best thing to do with your, your, your spells, but you might be standing in front of a battle where casting Fireball or Hypnotic Pattern or Slow is the more worthwhile option. So you're going to have to choose which spells you prepare really carefully. And me personally, I would always want to bring my go-to buff melee spell, like Spirit Shroud or, or Shadow Blade, and then load up on all my other good defensive spells and just normal wizard spells. Because if I see the opportunity to end the fight by casting Hypnotic Pattern, I'm still going to take it. Yeah. With that, let's level our Blade Singer up to level 12. We're going to gain a lot along the way. We're going to go from third level spells to getting fourth, fifth, and a sixth level spell slot. We're also going to pick up some more feats or ability score increases 
And we at level 10, we're going to get our next Bladesinger class feature, which is Song of Defense. What does this do, Kelly? So Song of Defense, as a reaction, when you take damage, you can use a spell slot to mitigate damage equal to five times the spell slot that you give up. Now, this is a great clutch situation. Oh man, you just got crit and you need to get rid of the damage. But in most cases, I think that I would still be relying on something like shield or absorb elements to get rid of more damage mm -hmm. for less cost. But in those dire moments where you get crit and are about to die, it might be worth it to look at blowing a spell slot. Yeah, I think a critical hit is probably the only case where I would use this ability, especially if it was a critical hit that was potentially going to knock me out of concentration otherwise. Um, but beyond that, I'm going to rely on shield and my other defensive features to do this. We also have to remember that when you get Song of Defense, this is also at the point when you're only a level away from getting a spell like Contingency. So we can also have a Contingency in place that if you get crit, teleport me away or with Dimension Door or something like that. So um, because there's a lot of defensive features that are coming online for wizards through their spells here, it might be pretty rare for you to actually use this feature, but it's clutch when it's there. I just don't feel good about spending a fifth level spell slot to negate my damage by 25. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a high cost for, for just, uh, it, again, it's basically just, are you going to die in this situation? Then maybe yeah. it's worth it. Yeah, if, it's, if I have a fifth level spell in play and it's the choice of reducing this damage or having to cast that fifth level spell again, totally worth it. So we got ability score increases or feats at level 8 and 12. And so I think that I would be looking at Warcaster around this time. I think you get a lot of mileage out of Warcaster here, but I think you could also be forgiven for just boosting whatever isn't maxed out from your intelligence and dexterity. So in the case of my Bladesinger, I would basically flip a coin and decide which of those two I want to boost up first. For example, if I got a really nice magic sword that had a plus to attack rolls on it i might go with the intelligence route first right so that's where i would want to be reactive here based on how the campaign's going based on what kind of enemies i'm fighting based on what kind of magic items i have and decide then yeah now when we look at the spells for around this level i think that some of the key ones that we want to keep in mind are things like dimension door and banishment uh Dimension Door, again, maneuverability on the battlefield is going to be pretty key for a Bladesinger because you have a lot of power when you're in melee combat. But as soon as you're in trouble, you want to be able to get away or, I mean, Dimension Door is just an iconic yeah. spell in general. Same with Banishment. I feel like Banishment is one of those spells that doesn't really speak to the Bladesinger but speaks to wizards in general as a way to end combat encounters. I also think you absolutely want to pack Polymorph as a Bladesinger especially by this level when you can have contingency with that as well because I think Kelly your contingency is amazing for a blade singer I had a contingency that if I was dropped below I think it was like 15 hit points or 20 hit points or something I immediately polymorphed myself into a T-Rex. Yeah. And that just allowed me to survive. So if you are a blade singer and you're in the thick of it and you get hit and hit hard, you don't want to be surrounded when you have only like 20 HP left. But if you turn into a T-Rex, you can be eating dudes and tail whipping other dudes and you now gain a large amount of hit points to stay the course in the front lines. If you love buffing yourself up as well with things like Mirror Image and Blink that don't require concentration, you might also want to take Fire Shield here as well because that's another concentration-free buff up. There's a lot of fantastic spells that we can take as our go-to spell, but the reality of it is is that whether or not you're a Bladesinger, the best option for damage dealing with a wizard at these levels of play is often animate objects. And I love the mental image of carrying an extra bag of silver long swords on your back to use as animate objects. And then at the start of combat, you cast the animated objects and the swords fly around you. That is a cool blade singer image. And then you just have this dance of blades swinging around you. And of course you want silver swords because silver weapons are, or adamantium ones. Uh, you could actually have both in a bag of holding that you animate and send out. And that way you do get some coverage for getting around damage reduction. Uh, so yeah, go go get yourself a, a, a bag of holding filled with silver swords or silver uh, or silver adamantium swords. Uh, I think maybe you might have to go with daggers to go with the the best version of the the damage that you can get. But just the idea of of, of being surrounded by magic swords 
it's it's the perfect image. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also think if we're looking at spells that are going to enhance your gameplay as a blade singer in melee combat, I think that we need to pay attention to greater invisibility as well. Yeah. Greater invisibility is going to be key because what's scarier than a wizard who can hit you with a sword? A wizard who can hit you with a sword that you can't even see. Greater invisibility is a great tool to have when you need that mixture of defense and offense as well because you're going to get the advantage on attack rolls from that. Really good with the elven accuracy uh, play there as well. I think we did mention for six level spells that you could also consider taking um, contingency for sure. Don't leave home without it. I would absolutely take create homunculus as well. So we have the homunculus and the familiar standard wizard stuff. There's an argument for tensor's transformation. Uh, this is a very malign spell because when you cast tensor's transformation, you can't cast other spells, but it does buff you up quite a bit. Um, Tensor's Transformation, to me, is most useful in those cases when you're facing an enemy that is resistant or immune to non-magical damage, so your animated objects are not going to do the trick anymore. So one last spell that you should look at is Wall of Force, and no wizard should ever leave home without it. But Bladesingers can do something a little bit different with Wall of Force that can be a lot of fun. If you're feeling daring and ready to boost your AC up and just go to town with your blade, you can drop Wall of Force around you and a chosen enemy, and you can pull Rorschach's famous, I'm not trapped in here with you, you're trapped in here with me. Now, for a little bit of a different take on this, if you're going up against enemy spellcasters at this level, you might want to pack Globe of Invulnerability. This is a beginning point where the theme of the Bladesinger as a Mage Slayer can really come into play. Uh, and if you're bringing Globe of Invulnerability and Counterspell and Dispel Magic, you're, as a Bladesinger, you are capable of fighting pretty well even when the magic gets turned off. And so being able to do that yourself, of dropping global vulnerability when you're up against other spellcasters, that's going to let you really even the odds there and uh, catch up with them. <laughs> yeah. So one last level up for our Bladesinger. We're now going to look at our level 16 Bladesinger wizard. And they gain their final features, a few more spells, and a final feat to choose from. So along the way to level 16, we're going to hit level 14, where we get Song of Victory. And now we're going to be adding our intelligence modifier to our damage rolls of all of our melee attacks. So that we're going to have a pretty hard-hitting one-two punch when we go Booming Blade, extra attack, and we're gonna have all these amazing concentration spells going on at the same time. At this level of play, you're gonna get a final feat choice here, and I actually think that either Fey Touched or Shadow Touch to just add a few extra elements of spell casting onto your Blade Singer might be a cool option. But I also think that if you don't have enough ways to get out of combat when you need to yet, Mobile actually speaks really well to the Blade Singer. Not only does it give you additional movement, but Mobile also allows you to move away from enemies that you're attacking without provoking opportunity attacks. Again, with the instance of using Booming Blade, Mobile might be a key feature. Also, if you're running low on spell slots and you're in the thick of it and you're low on HP, it might be a good move to back up and start being a wizard. This is also the time when you might want to take Warcaster. Uh, and there's a few reasons for this. By high levels of play, as a, as a high level wizard, you could have some really cool magic items. And you might want to be able to hold on to your Flame Tongue Longsword and your Staff of Power at the same time. This is going to make casting spells very difficult. <laughs> Having Warcaster might help you get around that. This is like that fringe benefit of Warcaster that a lot of people forget about, but that could come into play in an important way for Bladesinger as you go up the levels. Um, yes, you're going to have the opportunity to take advantage of the advantage on, con on concentration checks and also being able to hit someone with a spell as an opportunity attack is going to be really good up here as well. So I think by now the benefits of taking Warcaster have become too much to ignore. I would love to be able to fit in things like telekinetic or telepathic or lucky if I could. It's just really hard to get everything in there. So I, I again... By this, by this level of play, I'm going to look back on how I've done till this point and really assess what is going to fit best for the character. At this level of play, our spell selection is going to lean away from the melee combat focus and just be more generic wizard spells. But that's because wizard have some amazing spells at this level of play. I'm thinking things like Force Cage and Teleportation are going to just double down on all the things you're already doing. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think I'm probably going to end up taking spells with my uh, other selections here, like Simulacrum, Clone, Mind Blank. And of course, as we go on to ninth level spells, I think at that point, you're still taking things like Wish and Prismatic Wall, and maybe you might even take Blade of Disaster. Uh, I think at that point, it doesn't... You, you just have fun, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, yeah. by the time you get to set the, the ninth level spells, it's all kind of out the window at this stage of the game. Um, but, uh, and whether or not you want to, you know, go with the standard wizard shenanigans or still double down and just turn yourself into a dragon, um, go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that there's a lot of classes in D&D that are hybrids where you are making a big sacrifice um, there, or a trade-off. I think the Bladesinger doesn't really sacrifice that much. I don't know if the Bladesinger on their own is the most amazing damage dealer in the game. They're definitely in the upper echelons. I don't think that they are the best spellcaster, but they're in the upper echelons. And when you have someone that is playing in the big leagues in both categories, then you have a really impressive character. And, you know, we've talked about hex blades before, as well as having that main character syndrome. Um, and I think you'd really feel that with this class. There's, there's really nothing you can't do here. Uh, I, I, it, I, it's such a cool archetype to play. So the whole package of the Bladesinger presents a really interesting option for players in Dungeons and Dragons. I think that this really speaks to that idea of mixing the spell and sword. And I think it does it really, yeah. really well. Yeah. Uh, you do have to be aware of your ability scores, what feats and play style you want to bring to life with your Bladesinger. But hopefully some of the options that we presented give you some cool ideas to really make your Bladesinger sing. So this has been a look at the Bladesinger in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Tell us about your favorite ways to play Bladesinger in the comments below. The videos we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. We thank them deeply from the bottoms of our hearts. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our community by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which is Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more guides to various character classes in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.